All right, folks. Welcome to the Getting Your Edge podcast. My name is Dennis. And hi, I'm Judy Gratton. And we're here to help you right size your home and your life. Hi, and welcome to everyone to episode eight of Getting Your Edge, How to Right Size Your Home and Life podcast, brought to you by the fabulous Edge Group team, where we give you an edge in all your real estate needs. We have a really informative show. We're going to talk about something that nobody likes to talk about. But first, I'm your host, Dennis Day, and I have our co-host, Judy Gratton. She is back, still recovering from her shoulder surgery, but she's here. Welcome back, Judy. Thank you, Dennis. Yep, I'm the one-armed wonder right now, but I'm really excited to be here again. And I, I'm really excited to be able to introduce our special guest today, Brady Blake of Sound Legal Solutions, or PLLC, in Montlake Terrace. Brady is an attorney and the founder of Sound Legal Solutions, PLLC. Brady earned his degree in business administration from the University of Washington before attending Seattle University School of Law. That's a very nice school of law. It is. I know. My daughter's a lawyer. So (laughs) he graduated with his Juris Doctorate and is licensed to practice law in the state of Washington. He's focused on helping people with issues relating to estate planning, probate, personal injury, and real estate. And those, those fit right in with right sizing. So we'd really like to welcome Brady Blake. Well, hello, and thank you so much for having me, Dennis and Judy. Brady's here to talk about something that we all need to address, really, and we don't like to talk about it, and that is wills, estate planning, probate, and other legal topics, especially important to people who have large assets like a home. Before we get going on the interview, I just want to remind you this podcast is free with no subscription fees, no advertising, and I'm asking you to please send your feedback through whatever podcast you have, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts only. Subscribe, follow us, give us a rating on Spotify or the other directories, and share the link with someone who you think might need this information. This would really help grow our business and get our podcast out there to lots more people. All right, Judy. Okay, let's get started. Brady, can can you give us a little history about who you are and what you offer people with legal advising? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Brady Blake, as you said, and I do. I help people with estate planning, um, so helping them get their wills together, powers of attorney, um, trusts, things of that nature. Um, and I also help people with probate, which is settling uh, estates after a person dies. And so those are the main things that I focus on, as well as some real estate and personal injury as well. Um, and that is, I, I've been practicing in my business for three years. And yeah, we're just cruising right along. And I'm happy to share some information with you guys today. Well, thanks for being here, Brady. And the Edge Group team has really focused our business towards people who need to right-size their life, meaning their homes aren't working for them. They need a change. Questions often come up during the downsizing, but in fact, this isn't. This information is not going to be limited to just people who are who are downsizing or even own a home. This information is going to be great for everyone. That's true, Brady. I mean, who should be thinking about wills and estate planning now and and why? Well, I would say anybody. Um, I mean, the big, the big I tell people usually when big changes in life. And so everybody should have at least a basic will and some powers of attorney in place. If you're over 18, something could happen to you and you want to make sure that you have at least your basic affairs in order. And you don't have to have a big estate to do that because as we'll learn and talk about a little more um, like even a power of attorney if you're injured and you're in a coma who's going to be making decisions for you and helping you Um, and so those documents can help you in the estate planning process but I usually tell people like if you get married if you have children especially if you have children you have somebody that um, is dependent upon you in any way then it's very important to have these things in order so that you know, it, it just makes things so much easier for for your loved ones if something happens to you, whether it's incapacity or death. And 
uh, yeah, it's not it's not too difficult of a process or too expensive to get done. And so those would be the main things. Um, also, just a lot of people contact me there towards retirement time or they're, they're getting a little bit older. They've built up their uh, treasure chest of assets and they're starting to think about their legacy. And, and so they'll call me and talk to me at that time. And so I would say that, you know, major life changes, those are important times to do it. Unfortunately, if you get some sort of medical diagnosis that is not good, that would also be a very important time to get a hold of an estate planning attorney. I know when my daughter graduated from college and started practicing law, at that time, we were, she got a will because we were getting a will and we wanted her to. And she, and we were the beneficiaries of anything that she had along with my son, who's disabled. That was the only will she had. I'm sorry, my clock is going to ding in on us. But she now has two children. And I've been after her. You, you've you got to rewrite your will. Otherwise, that's a problem when you, when you come into this. So it doesn't start necessarily when you're in your 50s or 60s. Absolutely. So, Brady, most people know what a will is, but what's the difference between a will and a trust? Okay, so the main difference between a will and a trust is a trust will allow you to avoid probate. There's a will, will not. And just so that people understand what a probate is, that's the process of um, administering and settling a deceased person's estate. And so the will, you have to go to the court after a person dies and, and the personal representative or the executor gets that authority to go in and settle the person's estate. Whereas with a trust, um, for example, a revocable living trust, all those assets are going to be moved into the trust during your lifetime and managed by the trustee, which may be you um, and or your spouse. But then after you're gone, it will already say who the trustee is and who the beneficiaries are, who those assets go to. And so you don't have to go through the court process. Um, it allows some more privacy for large estates. And so that would be the main difference between a will and a trust. Brady, does the trust protect your assets before or after you're gone from creditors in any way? So some trusts will. Um, the typical trust in estate planning that a lot of people use is a local living trust, and that is not going to necessarily protect your assets from creditors or, you know, if you get sued or anything like that. Uh, you can for your beneficiaries after after you're gone and then it's being passed down to your beneficiaries through the trust, you can have provisions in there that will protect it from their creditors at that point. So that is a benefit of the trust. Um, you can also, well, a will won't do that the same because they will get uh, they will they will get their inheritance. They can't make a claim against the estate for the beneficiaries' assets. A creditor couldn't, but they may be able to get to those afterwards. After it's given to the the party that in correct your... depending yeah depending how they how they manage it. I know. Um, I mean, I've had people in the past who who told me when we've been in a real estate transaction that they put their home into a trust to protect it from potential medical bills should one of them get really sick. So that is not true then. It could be true. that I think what they're saying is that the medical billing creditor coming after them after they're gone. Okay. And okay. so not necessarily while they're living. Okay. And so I think we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier talking about my daughter, but a will is not a one and done event, right? It needs to be updated. What would be the trigger to update a will? So again, it kind of defaults back to when you would want to get one to begin with, but major life events. If there's like a divorce, another child, child born, uh, a, a big change in your financial situation, those would all be times when you might want to go and reevaluate it. But when we do, uh, when I create wills, I try to create them with my clients to last as long as possible. And so trying to consider things in the future and not write it in such a way that it's going to immediately be about invalidated. Or I have a lot of people that will call me and say, well, I have this house and it was written into my will to be given to a specific beneficiary, but I sold the house. And so now I need to get a new will made. Specific bequests like that are fine. But sometimes if somebody's more concerned about, I want this to last a long time, then I will just advise them on that, that, hey, if you write this in here and you sell the house or something, it's not a problem, but this is how it's going to be treated. 
So one thing I'm hearing here, because I know a lot of people think that they can just go buy a template for a will online and write their own will, but you mentioned the word invalidated. So Mm -hmm. the thing that I liked that I heard you say was that you write a will in such a way to protect their interests longer. And that's the value of using you or yeah. someone yeah, absolutely. like you. Absolutely. You get, the, it, you get the advising because sometimes I'll tell uh, potential clients that they call and they're asking me, you know, well, couldn't I just do this on my own? And I say, sure, you could do it on your own. But the problem is, is that it's a very complex process. You're not going to get the advising, you know, reading a paragraph or two online or from legal zoom, it's not going to give you the same thing. And then the biggest thing that I see with uh, self executed wills or self drawn up wills is that, you know, I had somebody come in a few weeks ago and they said, Oh, well, my mom has this will done. Can you take a look at it? And it was just signed and, and it wasn't valid. I mean, they think I printed this off the internet. I wrote in who I wanted to be beneficiaries and I wrote in who I wanted to be the executor and I signed the will. And so now I have a will and I'm like, I hate to break it to you. You don't have a will. You have a piece of paper with a signature on it. That's going to be very confusing to your beneficiaries and uh, the executor in the courts and everybody else, because they're going to try to use that and the court's going to reject it. And so that that is part of it as well, is that the execution has to be done properly. You can also have will challenges down the road. And so sitting around the house with the beneficiaries and the executor writing up the will and signing it and having them sign as witnesses is just ripe for, for challenge, that there was undue influence. Maybe the person didn't have capacity Um, And when you're working with an attorney, that attorney is kind of putting their stamp on it, that they've done their due diligence. And if the court did call them in as a witness, they could say, this person absolutely had capacity because I met with them. And these are the things that I did to check to make sure that they had capacity to make a will. So you're talking about mental capacity that they knew what they were signing. And okay. Yes, absolutely. Mental capacity to sign a will because that's one of the requirements. That's kind of like what we deal with when people want to just... For sale by owner, it's like you can, you know. <laughs> yes. Good luck. Yeah, abs- absolutely. <laughs> How do you make a will valid? So in Washington, the the person has to have capacity, and they have to make the will with the intent of making a will, and then they have to sign it in front of two witnesses. And, and typically, the way that we'll do it as well is we'll have the two witnesses and a notary to notarize. Um, an affidavit, a self-proving affidavit for the witnesses so that they won't get dragged into court later. Can that witness be family? Um, So yes, my advice to people is to not have anybody that's named in the will. And so you don't want to have anybody who's a beneficiary or, or an executor to be named or to be signing as a witness, because then that opens the door to claims of undue influence down the road. What happens if you don't have a will or trust? You pass away. What happens to your assets? Yeah. So good question, because a lot of people die without a will. I think the statistic is something like 60 percent of people don't have a will or something like that. And when we have to uh, administer those probates, it's a slightly more complex. It's not too much, but it defaults to state statute. So there is a state law that says when a person dies in Washington and if they have not chosen you know, through a will, how they're going to leave their possessions to other people, then this is how it's going to be divided. And there is a a flow chart, I guess, if you will. But my basic explanation would be this. If you have a surviving spouse, it's going to them. If you have no surviving spouse, it's going to your children in equal shares. If your surviving spouse isn't the parent of your children, there will be a different division. So if it's uh, uh, from a second marriage, it will divide it differently. And then, um, If it's just typically no spouse going to your children, it will go to them or to their surviving children if they're deceased. And then it just kind of goes down the family tree until it can't. And if there's no children and no grandchildren, then it will go up to your surviving parents. If you don't have any surviving parents, it goes out to siblings and then down to nieces and nephews. So they just kind of check the boxes of who is who's surviving and how closely are they related to you is, is the easiest way for me to explain how they how they go about it. But it is a bit more complex than that in the statute. I know we had a client once, an older gentleman, and he was wanting to sell his home. And we discovered when we opened title that his deceased wife was still on the title. Yes. And we started the process of trying to 
you know, we got the death certificate and did all the things that were required. And when yeah. her family, her children from another father heard that the home was being sold, then they came in and started protesting. We had to go through probate. It turned from being just a simple real estate transaction. It took money that he absolutely anticipated. It was a lot. So, so you kind of mentioned earlier to, you know, we've talked about what the probate is and then, you know, to avoid it is the only thing you can do putting things into a trust or the will is going to go through probate, right? Yes. I mean, there are some other techniques of transferring that property. So like a home, you could do a transfer on death deed. They aren't very typical. If a will was ex executed after that, then it would supersede. And so it gets kind of muddies the waters a little bit of knowing exactly how it's going to be transferred. Community property agreements between spouses would be another way to transfer property upon death, avoiding probate without a will. I would still recommend you have a will if you're using one of those, but it is a way that you can that you can avoid doing that. And just to touch on the scenario that you gave me, because that is like almost what I talk to every person who calls me about probates about. A lot of times it's a surviving spouse and they will say, or it's people who their spouse died a long time ago. And they'll say, you know, um, oh, I never did anything. Or do I need to do anything? My spouse died. And I will say, well, how's your home title do you know how it's titled and and you know let me pull it up and look at the title and see who's on the deed and a deceased person can't sell can't sign to sell the house and that's exactly what i tell them is the scenario you were in i go everything's fine you can live there for 30 40 50 years if you want to nothing's going to happen so there's no probate police that are going to come knocking at your door saying that you need to get this house out of your home the problem is is when you go to sell it or when you die and then your kids have to open two probates, one for your deceased spouse and one for you, and then it's extra time, uh, money, and it's just confusing because that person died so long ago. And, you know, like in the scenario that you were talking about, you do have to sort out, well, wait a minute, if this spouse died first, maybe their beneficiaries had some sort of interest in their community property of the, the, the marital community property estate. And oh, they so, thought they did. <laughs> yes, yeah. It doesn't no, always they mean they did. will, but but yeah, I mean, it, it, it. they could. And so you never know, especially if they died without a will. And then, like I said, if you have a spouse from a second marriage and children from a past relationship, then if you die without a will, it is going to divide it differently. And so somebody might end up owning, you know, 15% of this house or whatever, and then it, it becomes much more complex situation. And so having the will in place and also making sure to go through the probate are really important because it transfers that home into the surviving spouse's name only. And, you know, your situation sounds like it was a headache, but it's a much bigger problem if that person needs to sell their home because they are have serious medical crisis going on and they need to cover the expenses of that. And if that's the case, this is going to bog it down six to 12 months getting that home sold and, you know, at least and you just got to, you don't want that to happen in that scenario. What about other assets beyond real estate? Did those also become involved in this same dilemma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends. Thoughts. So the assets are put into two categories. You have probate assets and non-probate assets, typically. And so the probate assets would be real property, anything titled, so vehicles, any personal property, so items in your home, tangible personal property. I tell people it's a fancy name for your stuff that you have. <laughs> um, that That's all going to be going through the probate process. But non-probate assets would be things like um, retirement accounts, pensions that transfer to the surviving spouses, life insurance policies, annuities, investment accounts. So anything where when you set it up, they ask you for to designate a beneficiary. Those ones are going to pass outside of probate. And so that, you know, and that's another problem why people sometimes think that they don't have to do it because they're like, well, I'm still living in my house. I'm still paying the bills and they don't really think about the deed or the way it's titled. And they're like, I collected life insurance. Like, I'm fine. I got everything that I need and I'm still living in the house with all the possessions. So there's no need for it. But yeah, so for the titled property, it's really important. If a person left specific heirlooms or something, you'd want to make sure that those got to the beneficiaries. But other than that, you don't really need a probate to give Johnny the gun collection or whatever it may be. Yeah. Tell us what you do for estate planning. So 
typically what I do, if I just talk about my process a little bit, is I'll send out a questionnaire to my clients that they can fill out online. And it goes in, it asks a whole bunch of questions, starts off with personal information, family information, current marriages, past marriages, children, grandchildren, things like that. Then it will go into a section where it's going to ask about the client's assets. And it needs to be pretty detailed uh, in that portion because I am advising on all those things that we just talked about. If you have a life insurance policy, you need to make sure the beneficiary designation is set up. If you don't have any beneficiary designation on those accounts, then they will default to the estate and go under the will, whatever the will says. But I will look into their assets. And then the next portion is about who would you like to leave your stuff to? And who do you want to kind of be fiduciaries? So who would you want to be the executor of the estate? And who would you want to be? This is before you're dead, but if you're incapacitated, who would you want to be in charge of managing your finances? If you're incapacitated, who would you want to be in charge of uh, managing your health care decisions if you're incapacitated? And then the last one that it really goes over in that questionnaire is the advanced health care directive questions, which regard to when a person is on life support and the doctors deem that there's no reasonable chance of recovery. Are you a person who would want to remain on life support or you would want to be taken off life support and permitted to die naturally? So that's the starting process is to kind of get people thinking about that brainstorming, me gathering the information that I need to evaluate their specific situation and then make a uh, recommendation to them. And a lot of times it is just, hey, you need a will, you need powers of attorney, and, and you need this advanced health care directive. But sometimes a community property agreement might make sense. Other times you might need to have a guardianship for minor children included in your will. And we're going to talk about that because you have children under 18. That after that form is submitted, that's what we do is I schedule the consultation and then we sit down and we discuss all those things before drafting up the documents, finalizing them. And then the last step would be executing the documents, which is what we talked about earlier, having the witnesses there, notary, and getting them all squared away and sending them home to the client. So let me understand this, that will and trust deal trust deals with your assets after you die, but estate planning deals with a lot of things that could take place prior to your death. Absolutely. You know, one thing with the powers of attorney, so what that is, is it is a document that you execute that appoints a person and, and preferably an alternate or two as well to step into your shoes to make decisions for you. The ones that I make typically are if you become incapacitated. Occasionally, you can make one that's immediately effective. It's not as common, but sometimes people are like, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of getting older and my daughter does all my financial stuff and my husband passed away. He did all that before and I just kind of want to give them full access to all my finances. You can do that as well, but but typically having one is is in case you become incapacitated. And there might be, you know, just a good example is like you might have a life partner that you're not married to, but this is somebody you've been with for a long time and that you two are expected to make decisions together. But you don't have any legal right as a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever it may be to just walk into the hospital and start making decisions. And so having that power of attorney for somebody in a situation like that allows them to designate somebody that maybe isn't their spouse or their children or their parent or whoever it is to make those decisions for them because for their specific situation, it'd be somebody different. So that that's amazing. I'm just blown away at how much goes into it and how I don't think most of us understand that at all. So kind of switching from there, are estates or inheritances taxed by the U.S. government or Washington state? No to inheritances. So there's no inheritance tax, but the government's going to get it one way or another. So they tax the estate. Yes. Um, and not always, only certain estates. So the federal exemption amount, meaning that only estates over this amount are taxed is 12 and a half million for this last year. And so that's pretty high. And historically, that's the highest it's been. And it's, and it's typically hovered around 5 million, depending who's in Congress and in charge that may come uh, down, or it may go up higher, or it may get thrown out altogether. But but that's where it's at right now. And I would say that it's, it's always good to, to err on the side of caution and expect that it's going to come back down during your planning so that you can uh, make sure that you can avoid paying any taxes that you wouldn't have to and getting that uh, money to your beneficiaries. So in Washington state is a state that does have an estate tax as well. 
their exemption amount is 2.193 million. And so it's much lower, much lower. And as the real estate uh, prices are going up in Washington state, that can push more and more people into that range of, Hey, I have my resident, I have my, my resident house, but then I also have like a vacation home in Washington. Well, okay. You probably have over $2 million estate or you're close, including your, your other investments and assets. And so the way that's taxed is it's graduated. So anything in your estate over the 2.2 million, let's just say for ease, is going to be taxed. I believe it's 10% on the first million and then 15% on the second million and then a 20% on anything above that, I believe is what it is. Um, and, but just to give you an idea, they take a lot of money out of your estate. The, the federal one is much higher. If you have over the 12 and a half million, they're going to take 40% of everything over oh, high. Okay. So that uh, is a whole nother complex estate planning situation for uh, high net worth clients. I'm not dealing with that on a super regular basis, but it does come up. And so it's just very important if you do have a net worth in those ranges. So just think of the Washington state over 2.2 million roughly. Uh, and that's your net worth. That's all your assets minus all your debt. So Make sure you think of that when you're thinking of net worth. And then for federal, it's 12 and a half million. And so if you can kind of keep those numbers in mind, people who are thinking about estate planning that, whoa, that's a lot of tax, 40 percent on anything over that. I'd much rather find a way to get that to my loved ones and the people I want to take care of uh, rather than giving it over to politicians to make decisions about how to spend it. Do you help them find ways to protect that money? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That, that's part of the estate planning process right. is um, okay. you can't evade taxes, but you can you know, do proper planning to avoid or minimize your, your tax burden. Right. And that is part of the process. Brady, if somebody walked in to your office and said, my house isn't working, I need to downsize, I'm going to go to an RV or I'm going to go to a retirement home, what kind of unique advice would you tell them? So one thing that, you know, it might go against the initial idea to downsize. I think downsizing is good and I think it's necessary for a lot of people and I have plenty of clients that are doing that. The only caveat that I would say is one of the biggest uh, tax breaks in the uh, Internal Revenue Code is called the step-up basis. And so when you die, if you in, if your beneficiary inherits your home, they don't take that asset at the price you paid for it. What happens is through the probate process, there is an evaluation as of the date of death and they will assess the value of the home and then your beneficiary will inherit the home with that basis. So not everyone knows what the basis is, but let's just put it this way. If you bought a home in the 1950s for 200,000, it's worth a million now. You have 800,000 in equity in the home that's going to have to be paid if you were to go sell it. If you're downsizing and you go sell that, they're going to say, whoa, that's a you got a big uh, income this year from capital gains. But if you pass that to your beneficiary upon death, so if you live there all the way until you died, they're not taking it at the $200,000 you bought it. for. They're taking it at the million dollars on the date of death. If they sell it six months later and it's a, a, a million one. They're paying taxes, income taxes on $100,000 capital gains tax. So it's one of the most generous tax breaks in the whole tax code. And so if that is a situation where you're like, hey, I don't want to miss out on that, that's where I would say consider that. Just know that, hey, selling your home while you're still alive, you're going to pay a lot more taxes than, than if you didn't. But that being said, you know, sometimes people are like, hey, I'm in this million dollar home, I'm paying $1,000 a month in taxes or whatever it is, property taxes, you know, and I got to get out of here. It's not making sense for me. In that situation, it totally makes sense to, okay, how are we going to do this and sell this? And how am I going to min minimize my, uh, my tax burden here on this sale? But part of that might also be getting rid of tangible personal property or the stuff. So that's where I would say, you know, just before getting rid of everything, bringing it all to a donation center, maybe contacting your loved ones and people who you think might want something or, hey, there's something this has value or this has sentimental value, but I just don't need it because I'm going from a four bedroom house to a condo and now I don't have the space to keep all this stuff. So that would kind of, I mean, I don't know if that totally answers the question, but that would kind of be my, my talk with them about 
hey, make sure you're aware of this step up basis. You might not want to lose that tax break if, you know, I mean, it depends how old you are and how much time you plan on spending in that. So, Brady, uh, what documents or should every individual or family have and and where should they be in case of an emergency? What What's the best way to make sure that you're protected in case of an emergency and those documents are needed, like your will? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think I already talked about them. At the very least, people should have a will, a durable power of attorney for health care, a durable power of attorney for finances, and an advanced health care directive. Advanced health care directive only if they would prefer to be taken off life support and permitted to die naturally under the circumstances set forth. But as far as where to keep those documents... I advise my clients. So they go. Some state county attorneys will keep the documents in in their files. I I give them to the clients. They take them home. I advise them to keep them in a safe place that's preferably fire resistant at the least, if not fireproof. What I would advise people is not to keep it in a combination safe because if the people named in those documents don't know the combination, then they wouldn't be able to access that. Same thing with a safe deposit box is if they have one of those and they put their will in there, which commonly happens, and the person isn't named on that account, they're not going to have access. And so especially with the powers of attorney, like in a, an emergency to get those documents, that could be very detrimental. What do you think about scanning them and keeping them in something like a Dropbox or a online? Do you think it's safe enough or is I it mean, risky? The issue is that a court... And like a court's not going to accept an electronic copy of a will. So they want the wet signature. Original. Copy. Yeah. And, and that's a reason I don't hang on to it. One of the reasons I'm just like, it's a lot of liability. If I'm like, I'm the holder of the will and something happens, there's no rule of where you can or can't keep it. Sometimes I'll advise clients like Washington. I know they have a will repository where you can go and you can pay to have your will stored at the uh-huh. courthouse. It costs money. I don't. I think it's not much. I think it's like $25 or something. But if somebody wants to do that, they can. And then you could tell your your executor, hey, it's at the King County Courthouse. Uh, you know, you need to ask the clerk and show your ID if you want to get it and have a death certificate. And then they'll release it to the person at that point. So that is one way. But as far as the electronic copies, they just don't work. A bank's not going to really accept electronic copy of a power of mm-hmm. attorneys. So if you're incapacitated, they're usually going to want to, if they're doing things right, they're usually going to say, I want, I want to see the hard copy. I'll make my own copy at the bank and then we'll put it in your file and we'll add that person who you've named to the account so that they're able to make transactions on it. Can you fill out the forms and documents electronically? So I do not. There is Washington did uh, during the pandemic, they have remote nor- notarization that is allowed. In my experience, it's just a little bit complex and you have to keep files. It all has to be on video. And there's some some rules in there that make it kind of prohibitive from doing um, the electronic one. And I know in, in the beginning, some of the concern of estate planning attorneys was, well, what if they get rid of this because it was temporary during the pandemic? And I think it's permanent now. But, you know, what's going to happen if you bring in this electronic copy to a judge 15 years from now? And then they're like, well, why is this electronic? We only take them this way. So for ease of confusion, I always do hard copies. I don't do electronic signed wills or anything like that, although it is possible. Brady, is there one really important thing you feel people should be aware of regarding estate planning? Just going back to like, the statistic that almost 60% of people or whatever don't have any estate plan in place and a little bit of planning and a little, a little bit of spending up front to get an estate plan done can save all kinds of headaches down the road. And that's usually where um, it gets very expensive for the estate and attorney gets involved at that point to clean up and pick up the pieces of one that's not done correctly and that would really be the big thing is like, it's just a little bit of planning. It doesn't take too long. It's not a super expensive and it can make things so much easier in case of an emergency. Cause that's really what you're planning on is like either an emergency or death. And it's like, no one really thinks about those on a regular basis. We kind of go about our daily lives thinking, oh yeah, it's fine. Nothing's going to happen to me. And, and you never know somebody mm-hmm. on my way home from here, I could get in a car accident and be in a coma in two hours. We, you just don't know what's going to happen. And so having that planning in place can make it so much easier for doctors, for banks, for the person who has either passed away or who is incapacitated to 
get the things done that need to get done. And really, it's it's all about making sure your loved ones um, are taken care of. Something happens to you or they don't have as much trouble to deal with. But how much does it cost? So, I mean, I think it really ranges. Uh, trusts are always more expensive. Think that you could probably get a will from an attorney, a simple will. I do them. I think it's 500 bucks if it's just a will. Somebody's like, I just want a will and nothing else. Um, and it could range all the way up. If you have very complicated trusts and you're over that $12.5 million mark on your net worth, then you could be spending 10000 or more. But that would be rare circumstances. But usually I would say it ranges anywhere from $500 to $2,500, somewhere in that range to get your estate planning stuff done based on your specific circumstances. Wow. I, I'm I'm just, I mean, you've explained the what it is that people need and why they need it. And really the importance, again, of having a professional help them. And it that just seems like such a small investment to make sure that you're protected. And we've run into so many issues in the sale of people's homes where there hasn't been a will and, and the outcomes are difficult at best. So I, I'm just I can't tell you how much we appreciate you sharing your your information and your experience with us. And do you have any last words of advice that you would like to share something we haven't covered? I don't know. There, there's, you know, like you said, there's just so much that goes into it that you don't think about. Uh, the average person just doesn't think about. And we have sit here and we're talking for 30 minutes to an hour and we're just scratching the surface of things that can come up or be discussed um, in, in different scenarios and situations. Because really working with an attorney is important because of it's very fact specific. Like I said, I have to gather a lot of information just to advise somebody on what's what's going to best for them or going to work out for them. And without that guidance, you know, you aren't going to know. And, and a lot of times uh, you can get a free consultation with estate planning attorneys. And it's just at least then you can start to figure out what you need to know or what you need to be thinking about. But, you know, that's just really it. And other than that, I am more than happy to help anybody who's out there listening who wanted to contact me. And my website is soundlegalsolutions.com. And my email is brady at soundlegalsolutions.com. And you can contact me on my phone as well, which is 425-977-9971. That would really be my uh, my one message that I have for people is if you want to get your estate planning done, contact an attorney and, and at least get some guidance on it. Well, Brady, thank you so much. Um, and once again, I'll just plug your name and your company name again, Brady Blake with Sound Legal Solutions. And uh, we'll put your contact information in the episode description and a transcript of this podcast. So hopefully if people need help, they can reach out to you. Oh, thank you very much. And just thank one you. more thing is, you know, I provided the the freebie, the handout, and um, that has my contact information as well. And if anybody takes a look at that, it just kind of is a, a run over of where to start and what to start thinking about before you uh, do your estate planning. So thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Brady. That freebie will be posted at our website at edgegrouprealestateservices.com. And you can click on episode eight and the freebie will be there for you to download if you wish. And that's it for episode eight, <laughs> the Edge Group Real Estate Teams, Getting Your Edge, How to Right Side Your Home and Life podcast. As always, we'll have the freebie packed with information from Brady Blake and Sound Legal Solutions on our website, edgegrouprealestateservices.com. And we have a special gift from the Edge Group team. That is, if you are the first person to give us a five-star review of this podcast at Apple Podcasts, that's the only place you can do a review, you will get a $25 Amazon gift card for taking a few minutes to review us. Or you can send us an email review directly to answers at edgegrouprealestateservices.com. We'd love to give this gift card away. And please follow us, like us, share us, comment on this or any of our previous podcasts. Thanks for watching. Goodbye, Brady. Bye, Judy. Bye. Bye. Thank you. And that's it for episode eight of the Getting Your Edge, How to Right Size Your Home and Life podcast. Thank you so much for listening and or watching. Goodbye.
Mm, that's it, folks. Thanks for listening. And stay tuned for future episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Goodbye.